much longer than the uh, mochi were even alive. So it's a timeless source of power, a timeless source of energy. You also see, as Marianne talked about, a connection between that culture and the idea of riding waves in the reed boats. Now, the last time I was there, uh, that's my friend Alberto Ucanyan, who was actually fishing on his reed craft. This is how they grow the reeds to this day, and it's the exact same way they grew the reeds several thousand years ago. Okay? The technology involved is very primitive, and yet when you look at these reeds, they have a triangular cross-section that allows them to be bundled into watertight uh, craft that are quite remarkable. And here they are getting ready to do that. To do that. And now they're actually uh, putting the, the, the uh, um, I think one says you can help me with, the, there, there, there's a word for bundles in Spanish. I can't quite remember what it was. They, they use it, it's, it's, it's not a balsa, but the idea is that they're able to create these craft and you can use them for surfing. In fact, um, that one right there is right over there. <laughs> so, we, actually, we had that one made and uh, there's Alberto. And Alberto, there's Jericho Poplar riding, getting ready to, to take off on a wave. And there's Alberto riding one. But what I want to do now is go even further back, because the technology of the reed craft, and this is made out of reeds. This is a replica of a craft that Thor Heyerdahl was designing, and the way it was shaped was designed so that he could use it for an open ocean traverse from Peru all the way out into the South Pacific. And the fun thing for me is that I met Dr. Heyerdahl, and that reed boat right there, that's this. Okay? And Dr. Heyerdahl was in Peru investigating the Mochi culture and the Chavin culture and also the Chimu cultures, because as he said, there's no waves in the Mediterranean. He wanted to see what those cultures were like in response to their proximity to an ocean full of power. And that's why he was there. Uh, in fact, here is a um, shame and ceremony that we had. There's Dr. Heyerdahl. That's me. And we were, the shaman was to, to, to summon waves to the coastline. All right? But what we really want to talk about is the archaeology of the mochi. Because there's two people, who, other than Joseph Campbell, there's two people who have really informed my version of these cultures. One was Thor Heyerdahl, and the other was, is, uh, Dr. Christopher Donnan. This is one of my prized possessions right here because, you know, he's, he's signed that, right? Wow, man. It's like, Dukana Moko, I can get his signature. <laughs> he's here? Wow. And he was actually, he, he, he was standing right here. Dr. Donnan was, right, it was right about here, right? Wow. It was right Not only there. that, <laughs> I got my picture taken with him. <laughs> okay, because if there's one person who is dedicated his life to understanding the mochi, and who basically claims with a lot of integrity that they were uh, the Western Hemisphere's most advanced pre-Columbian culture. They did things that no other culture's done, not the Aztecs, not the Mayas, not the Incas. Unfortunately, we have no written record of it. In fact, of course, the Mochi from 100 AD to their decline around 800 AD, this was like three, 400 years before the Incas. But Dr. Donnan, was basically, and is basically, the leading expert on this culture. Uh, and the culture that was discovered, uh, one part of the culture that was discovered um, in 1988, the royal tombs of Sipan. Um, this particular image, that's an earring. It's actually a little earring. Okay? But how they did this gold work, each one of these little globes here, that is a hollow globe of gold. And the technology that it took to create this and create many of the artifacts that were uncovered in this world too, absolutely astounding. Superior to anything else that's been discovered anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. And basically, in technical terms, the equal of anything found anywhere in the world, including Egypt. Now, for example, this was the tomb where this was the tomb, this is the royal tomb. 
this is what it looked like originally. Okay. And so you can see this is an extremely advanced culture. They had irrigation systems that are used to this day. They had the coastline full of fish. Uh, here's the dig at Sipan. Here is one of the little guys that they found. And the artifacts that were uncovered in this tomb, this untouched tomb, absolutely unsurpassed. Um, here's Dr. Donovan once again, and you can see just the tiny, the, 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 the dentist tools, the tweezers that they would use to uncover this incredible tomb. And the interesting thing about this, and you can see all of this stuff, all buried, and one of the reasons a, a, a royal personage in, of the Mochi was buried with all this stuff was because the next in line didn't want all this. That's his stuff. I'm going to have my own stuff. And you have successions of royal families. Now, a lot of the tombs have been looted. A lot of the artifacts are spread all around the world in private collections. However, this particular tomb was as rich as it could possibly be. And inside the tomb, you have, you have seashells. And in fact, there's a, another tomb they found where there were seashells and sea sand, as considered sacred, to the point where they would be buried with these royal personages. Once again, here are the seashells. So what you have here is, in Dr. Donnan's book, a further example of how amazing this culture was, because they didn't have any writing to our nothing that's been uncovered to date that give us, gives us any linear sense of their ability to communicate. They communicated through myth. Okay? So what you have here is the image that was wrapped around a ceramic pot. And the image, here we have the Mochi's version of Laird Hamilton. <laughs> right? There he goes, right? Out there braving those seas. Yeah, there he is. There's Kelly. Right? <laughs> and um, this is one of the few that we've seen where this is a human personage where theoretically what this involves, that is his paddle. But here, this would have been possibly a hollow gourd that was used to carry messages up and down the coast. Mm -hmm. If we know what those messages consisted of, which we don't. Right? But once again, the mythology around that surrounded the ocean, what the ocean represented to them, if you went out into the ocean, who you were, that was really something special. Uh, the Mochi Tomb at Dos Cabezas. This is a great book by Dr. Donnan. Uh, and that's uh, the pyramid there. What I like is, look at the surf. Okay? This whole, there's all kinds of surf right there. And this is what it originally looked like. So they're building huge pyramids within sight of the ocean. I mean, you can climb up the top and you can go, yeah, man, it's, look at that. That's the, that's the sandbar. All right, let's go. Oh, wait a minute. It's good over there. Where are we going to surf? Right. Who knows? But what I can tell you is that that's where the pyramid is, and that's a perfect wave right there. <laughs> <laughs> truly is. Okay, Pukatnamu is on its day an A-plus wave. It's as good as any wave in California. So this culture, they were seeing perfect waves. They were seeing lines to the horizon. Um, at the same time, they're able to do jewelry of the finest quality. Uh, this octopus neck uh, 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 breast piece was just, uh, and once again, the, uh, let me go back and push the wrong button, these hollow gold spears. The technology it took to make those, I mean, I don't know that there's all that much difference between what it took to make those and what it takes to make an iPhone. Okay? As, or as Thor Heyerdahl said, we haven't changed much as human beings in about 5,000 years. Okay? We may have more advanced technology. But as people, and especially in terms of how we're affected by mythologies, we're kind of the same. Now, this particular book by Bodden uh, has some interesting images in it, not the least of which is the Wake del Sol. This was a pyramid that was probably almost as big as the Khufu Pyramid in Giza in Egypt. I mean, it was huge. 130 million bricks went into this thing. And the Spanish were so interested in what might have been there, actually diverted a river to actually break it down and see if they could wear it away to see what was inside of it. So the idea of riding a reed boat across the sky, 
This is a particularly interesting tomb where it's hard to see, but this guy, this person inside of his tomb to meet his maker and go off to infinity surrounded himself with interlocking breaking waves. Uh, the, I, the, this particular royal personage, where he surround, he used waves as his particular symbol. Can you imagine one of the political parties in this day and age <laughs> deriving all their power from, yeah, we're surfers, we challenge the waves, when we get into the White House, we're going to put boards all over the place, right? <laughs> well, that's kind of what they did. Chen Chan. The largest, one of the largest archaeological sites in the Western Hemisphere, right there next to the surf and along here, you can still see places where the reeds were growing in the marshes. This is a um, scale model of the city, and each successive royal family would build their own palace. This is the one that I thought was really interesting, because here you have a ceremonial courtyard. This is the Humboldt Current, full of fish. But this is their version of ocean. Their version of the ocean was waves to the horizon. And you have to understand, they didn't know where those waves came from. They didn't have any satellites. They didn't have any meteorologists. This was all just something magic. And the power in each and every wave could knock us. We could all hold Lake, lake Arms and go out into the water, and the one wave could come and knock us all over. And then there's going to be another wave and another wave. And there could be waves. Uh, there's times in Peru where the waves can last for up to a week, one after another. So, and that's what we're talking about, real power. So, when you think about how they saw the ocean, it's not too much different than the way surfers see the ocean. In fact, this particular ceramic doesn't show a mochi using a reed craft for fishing. He's using it just to wide waves. In fact, the theory is, is that this was a rite of passage whereby a young mochi would-be fisherman had to create a bundle, had to create his own craft and get out into the ocean and see if he could survive it. If he could survive the waves, then he could pass this rite of initiation. Well, what happened to the mochi? The answer is, we don't really know. Now, there's some theories and one of the theories, of course, is the idea of El Nino. El Nino is the Spanish word for the child, and the reason El Nino is called El Nino is because the child represents the birth of Jesus in Christmas time, and that's when El Nino nominally is as strong as it can be in the Southern Hemisphere, which makes it winter time, and that's why it rains up here. But the idea of what really happened to him? Well, that's called the El Nino Southern Oscillation. That's the scientific name for it, by the way. Okay, so maybe El Ninos came and washed them away. Maybe it was overpopulation, and they just out they just crowded themselves out of existence. Maybe it was earthquakes. Maybe it was drought. Now, does any of this ring a bell in terms of Southern California? <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, yes, Phil. Uh, two questions. Is this parallel in Peru about northern Oregon? Is that where we're talking about? No. No, northern Oregon would be southern Chile. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, then it would be close to what parallel in the north? Uh, you're, you're, the, we're talking about northern Peru is comparatively close to the equator. Okay, okay. so, so okay. Well, uh, northern close, Peru yeah. is Ecuador, Thank and you. Ecuador is called Ecuador because the equator runs through it, so it's comparatively well yeah, north. Yeah, right. But yeah. interesting point because it has the surf as if it was in Oregon. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. And the second question, um, <laughs> does this predate Hawaiian surf culture? Well, I was once on a, uh, uh, a dais with Dr. Ben Finney, who is the recognized expert in the history of surfing in Hawaii. And Dr. Finney has certainly taken surfing back 
to in Hawaii back to about 1689 is the earliest known point where we can talk about surfing in Hawaii. Here we're talking a thousand years before that. So uh, riding waves, it goes back a lot further than the Hawaiians. Of course, the Hawaiians don't like to hear that. <laughs> so, we just kind of, so what I said was, at this thing, I said, well, with all due respect to Dr. Finney, you know, we're not talking about the first surfers were in Peru. However, we are talking about an opportunity for people to use waves for recreational purposes, as per what Thor Heyerdahl talked about. Yeah, a thousand years before the Hawaiians. Easy. Yes. Could you speak just a minute on the medicinal culture? pertaining to mochi surfers, there's a there's a holistic approach to life, and very little disease amongst those cultures. How is it I can't. I really don't have the background to talk about the actual science of their medicinal uh, um, uh, regimes, if you will. But they were extremely healthy uh, because got a diet of fish and plants yeah. for the most part. Right. 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 So, but there were cases where they have found, uh, they have uncovered tombs where the uh, personage appeared to have a significant case of arthritis. Uh, so we really can't really we can't really say all that much about that particular aspect of the archaeology uh, and the uh, research that's been done into the mochi. It's an interesting question. I know that surfers uh, they try to be really healthy. But uh, you know, I, and their holistic approach to surfing kind of rings a bell because you got to stay healthy to be a surfer. But we don't really know what the mochi did in terms of their diet versus their health. I think I was thinking more about indigenous cultures succumbing to disease, whether it's smallpox in the North America. We or just or can't say because once again, the record we have of the mochi kind of stops around 800 A.D. and we just don't know. Or at least I'm not aware of any research that would lead me to. Uh, venture forth any theories. Were you down as a uh, surf rider when you first originally? The first time I went down there in 1988, I went there because I was the founder of Surf Rider and they wanted me there. Uh, I went there again in 1990 under the same conditions. Uh, in 2002, uh, by that time I had started the second nonprofit, the Groundswell Society, and we, we, act, we put together an expedition called the Long Rides of, of Peru, and that was a Groundswell Society trip. We so. did through Surf Check, we did a thing through Lima trying to donate boards so that these kids that want to learn how to surf can learn how to surf. But what we found too is we got a little involved, and I'm, I'm curious on the pollution problem, like in Lima, the beaches and some of the pollution problems down there. I didn't know if Surf Rider Swell got involved in any of that. Um, the surf Rider hasn't. It, that, as long ago as I was a part of the organization uh, in, in functional terms. The whole idea of going to Peru, we had more than enough pollution issues to deal with right here in yes. California. Okay, and of course there has been a major effort in Peru to solve those issues and surfers have become a significant force in terms of uh, the health of the ocean and um, that's been in about the last eight to 10 years. Well, let's give Glenn a round of applause. Chamayo, Chamayo, Chiclayo. Chikama. And, oh, and so Chikama. there were surfers, these young surfer men that were standing there and they were talking to my colleague and they were just adoring the surf as we're standing there looking at all those breaks coming in. I, I didn't appreciate it at that point, no. uh, but they sure did. And they thought it was just pretty darn amazing. So um, I had a great time in Peru and I encourage all of you to go. And Chan Chan that he showed you pictures of, amazing. I mean, it's just amazing. So I think it rivals um, other places in, um, in Peru. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring down this um, screen. Uh, screen. That's, thank you. <laughs> and behind us here is a wonderful exhibit that is all about the Moche people. And I, I want to thank Moses Wool. He donated six pieces of pottery uh, to this exhibit and this museum. And thank you so much for your generosity. <laughs> So you have some time to go 
through the exhibit and to look at all the wonderful things in this collection. And I do want to tell you that um, we have some flyers and some forms that Julia and Nina have back here. Um, upcoming events next month is April 20th. We're going to be talking about the global prices of oil and how that impacts both positively and negatively our businesses here in Ventura County. So Charles Sandlin from Roadrunner Shuttle is here, and he's going to be one of the speakers on it's a good thing that gas is low. So um, <laughs> he's going to talk about that, and we're going to have another oil company come and talk about why that's not so good. And so oh, then have a global overview of oil uh, uh, globally. So that's next month. We have some flyers. You'll get notifications on that. And then upcoming after that, we'll celebrate World Trade Week and then have a digital cybersecurity talk um, in, the, in the next few months. So thank you all for coming. Really appreciate you being here. And please enjoy the wonderful exhibit. So thank you.